so when I first uh, got into music, I think I must I was just a, a baby, really a kid, maybe six or seven. Elvis Presley came out, and um, you know, of course, I saw Elvis on TV and was enamored. As a matter of fact, one time, this older kid took me to the movies to see King Creole, and I was a uh, just a kid, and, I, and so I went and saw King Creole. When I first saw it, was that, 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 that black hair and singing, and just the way how cool he looked. He was just such a beautiful dude, and he was so cool. And plus, he was tough. So he was pretty but tough. He was all the cool shit you like, you know. And um, actually, what happened was, my parents didn't know what happened to me, so they called the police. And so the police found me and took me home, and I had been out watching Elvis Presley movie with an older guy. So then there was a picture, I fell asleep, right? So they took a picture of me, say, a Punky Punky Meadows gets lost going to see Elvis Presley and it's actually in the newspaper so it has me sleeping with my little crew cut you know I had a little crew cut look like a, like a little baby bird or something you know skinny neck and the whole thing but uh yeah so that was in the newspapers that I ran away and I ran away to see Elvis Presley you know so then I was hooked after that and of course as I got older I really got into Elvis a lot because Elvis was, was the man I, st I still love Elvis you know and uh and then of course uh the Beatles came out and before that though I actually started playing guitar like when the Ventures came out, so I was playing Pipeline, Walk Don't Run, all those kind of songs, you know, Rumble, you know, with with, uh, with um, those kind of guitar songs, they were really awesome. And uh, I would learn to play, um, you know, themes on like Bonanza on TV and all that kind of stuff, Beverly Hillboys, so I learned to finger pick country music and all that kind of stuff, which is really awesome. And then, uh, of course, the Beatles came out, you know, and that chord sort of set the course for everybody back then. Because then I saw, you know, you can play guitar, write your own songs, you know, and 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 the whole thing, and so of course I, I really got that, that whole thing, the, the Beatlemania thing, and then all the British bands, you know, and, and um, as a matter of fact, I did an album with a band called The Cherry People back in like 1968, and it was a band like the Monkees, they had us all, you know, looking pretty, and we went out to LA and recorded did some videos out there, and we had a song that charted, did, did uh, Dick Clark, American Bandstands, The Cherry People, and, uh, and, and we did that, it was kind of like, it was like the Monkees, that kind of thing, you know. But then, you know, we were playing in, 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 in the village in New York City at the Cafe Wongs where I was playing. And uh, that was just, that was, and, and uh, that's where I first saw Hendrix. And we would come on and we would play, right? And the girls would sit up front and they didn't even serve alcohol in there. It was just soda pops and stuff. But the girls would come on scream when we played, right? We were playing all Sgt. Pepper songs and all that kind of stuff. And then Hendrix would come on and all the girls would leave, they were scared. But all the musicians would run to the front and go, what the fuck, you know, and he was just, you know, just burning it up with, you know, guitar. And so after that I said, no more, no more of that, that kind of stuff. So we left New York City and left the Cherry People album and all that monkeys kind of thing. Went back to D.C. where I'm from and got a gig in there as a house band. We played in this club called Silver Dog Play three years straight and that's when we started getting our chops together, playing heavy stuff, writing our own music and that sort of thing. And so we were pretty popular around town there, you know, so we played did all the nightclub scene around there, you know, for, for years on end, and I, I made a good good living doing that. I had my own townhouse and cars and stuff, and I, plus I played every single night for like three or four years straight in, in, one, in one band. And we wrote a lot of material, so I got my songwriting chops down, and also my guitar chops down playing and stuff. Because I liked everything, and I, you know, we would play Motown, country, the British blues, heavy metal, we'd play everything. And I like all the different types of music anyway, and it kind of taught me how to play different styles with my guitar, you know, I mean, learn how to play horn lines, with octaves when we played Midnight Hour and that sort of thing. So I love all that kind of stuff, you know. So anyway, so we did that and Cherry People stayed together for, for a pretty long time. And then we were playing at this club called The Bayou and then Greg Jafria walked in. And he was really cool looking, you know, and he saw me, he thought I was cool and he said, hey man, we got to start a band together. And so I said, well, awesome, yeah. And I was kind of tired of the Cherry People thing. You know, Cherry People, we've done that and I was kind of over that. So I said, all right, cool. He said, he, so he's from Biloxi, Mississippi. He said, yeah, come on down there. <coughs> so I went down there to see Greg and then I saw his band. The band was terrible. I mean, they were a bunch of goofy guys. Had this little teeny singer that was singing like "Pupito, Pupito." <laughs> I don't know what he was singing. But I said, "Greg, man, this is not cool. It's not going to work, man." You know. So I um, mean, anyway, so I was, you know, disgruntled and disappointed. So I went back home, and I called Mickey Jones, who was my my buddy. You know. And so I called Mickey. and said, "Hey, man, I, you know, what's going on?" He says, "Well, we have this band in Boston called Daddy Warbucks. Ralph Mormon singing and Jimmy Nolan playing guitar, and they didn't have a drummer." And they wanted me as a guitar player. So I said, yeah. So I went up there. The band was great. Ralph Mormon is actually the singer who went on to sing the Joe Perry's Project. Great singer. So, and I had met Ralph years earlier in, in Georgetown where I played in D.C. And he came up and you know sung some songs. He'd sit in and we'd do some like Jeff Beck, Rod Stewart stuff. And I, I think I said, the fucking guy's incredible. One day I'll be working with him. So anyway, so I went up there. So I'm working with, with, with Ralph and Mickey and Jimmy. And I brought my, my, my drummer from the Cherry People, Rocky, up there. So he played drums. 
So we, we put the band together up there. We're really good, but unfortunately, we had this guy that was that, that was kind of managing the band, not really managing, but the but the, but the guys putting the money into it. And he was like this biker guy from Hell's Angels kind of guy. And I didn't realize that because when I met him, he had a nice sweater on. He was a nice guy. But then as it went down the road, I, I realized he was a biker guy, and so you know, it kind of got to be a kind of a touchy situation there. And he wanted to own us and. He start beating people up and stuff. If they, you know, we'd be hiding in the back rooms. There like, comes Louie, look out, you know. And he would have these these two Doberman pinchers and stuff. You know, of course he was high on drugs all the time. He would laugh and hold these these these, these big dogs. Said, don't let them loose. Don't let them loose. We had to go to him because we needed money. We couldn't eat, right? So he'd give us money and stuff, you know. And we'd go buy a hamburger or something. One time we tried to cook some Gaines burgers. We were so hungry, it didn't work out. But uh, so we had this big house in, in Boston, and we played and, and up there. And, and so eventually we said, well, we can't make any money up here, so let's go down where I live in D.C. Because I have a good reputation down there. You know, I mean, all the club owners know me. They know I'm going to be cool. So, so we go down there, and right away we have a job. At, at first at the Bayou, which was a great club. We played there for a couple months. And then I went to the Bogies, which is where Daddy Warbucks played there for for two years. But then we also we recorded a record with with. Daddy Warbucks, which became Bucks, and Jack Douglas produced that. He, you know, produced Aerosmith and all that kind of stuff. And he actually produced that record, Bucks, and that, but that was put in the can because Frank Conley, who was our manager then, um, got discovered the money or something. Then he owed money for the for the record or something. So they so Capital kept the record. And they kept it in the can, so we never got it. So we went back to DC so we could at least play. So we go back there and we played at this club called Bogies, and we played there for two years straight. And Really did really good. It was a really great band. It was a rock and roll band, like I mean, just a really good rock and roll band. And then Greg comes up again and sees, sees me and Mickey and, and Bugs. He goes, "Hey man, we got to start a band together," you know. So he said, "Cause we loved Greg. He was cool. He was cool looking. As soon as he walked in the room, you, you just that guy's cool. You know what I mean? He just had all this charisma and stuff. And he was a cool keyboard player too. So we said, "Let's do it." So we broke up. Um, Daddy Warbucks and Mickey and I and Greg went upstairs and he had this upstairs loft up there. The, the club owner did Mike Backyard. He let us go up there and rehearse. So we started writing songs together. The first song was The Tower, then Rock and Rolls. So we were looking for a singer. So we went up to look at this singer at a club in Georgetown, and we were looking at this singer and said, he's not right, but Barry was playing drums. And we said, holy shit, we'll take Barry. Barry was, because he was just a killer drummer. So we took Barry, of course, easy to Barry said, yeah, man, I'm ready to go. You know, because you know, we saw we were going to be cool and stuff. And then Mickey said, um, I know this singer named Frank. He has a voice like a siren. I mean, he's like Robert Plant. We said, okay, bring him down. So Frank comes down and so he starts with those pipes, you know, when we were doing the tower, he goes, that's it, man. So we knew we had something special in right then, you know. So we rehearsed up there. We wrote, we were with the tower and we wrote rock and rollers and some other songs too. And then of course we did some, some few cover tunes that we dug, you know, and stuff like that. We didn't have the songs yet really, you know, to, to, to do a full set, but anyway. So we go down there, and we, be, we were the first band to become... Oh, and as a matter of fact, we found the Ben, the ben Hur music that opens up our angel thing now, when we, that big that biblical music. We all went down to this little record store and found it from Ben Hur. said, we'll open up with that, right? And so, and that was... And glam was just starting, and we became... We were glam right away. We decided we wanted to be, we wanted to be glam. I was always kind of glam anyway, in the cherry people and, and daddy walks in the West, so... So we had the, the whole look going on, and we had these big flash pots off in the club, you know what I mean? And, and it was so funny because it, as soon as we started playing, the flash pots would go off and all the bottles in the back would fall off the bar and crash, you know? And, and we had the whole thing going on, and, and we were just killing it. And, it was, and it, was, it was sounding great. We looked great. We had lines around the block. People were freaking out. So we started, um, we invited these different managers down, Lieber and Krebs, you know, who managed um, Aerosmith and ACDC and all those cats, Sandy Perlman, who managed Boyster Cole, came down, David Joseph, and they, we had a bidding, bidding war starter. They all wanted to manage us. I remember at one, one point we had Greg and Mickey and I were on a phone conference going phone with Lieber and Krebs. He goes, if you don't sign with us, it's a mental masturbation. You guys have got to sign with us. And, you know, and I actually wanted to go with Lieber and Krebs because I knew David, because David at one point asked Mickey and I to play with the New York Dolls. And we said, hey, listen, we got this band called Angel. You've got to come and see it. And so, if we, so if we turned the dolls. They said, okay, so he came. What do you want? We saw us. He freaked out. He loved it. So, you know, we had a bidding war going. And then one night we were playing, and Kiss came down. They had been playing at the Capitol Center. So, you know, the A's and Paul and Gene came down. And they saw us, and, uh, and, and they freaked out. I remember when I, they freaked out. He said, fuck, you guys are fucking great. And I remember, I, I remember I'm like 6'1, right? And Gene came down in these boots. He was like 6'5. And I'm always shaking like hands like this, but I was like shaking his hand like, wow, that's fucking cool. <laughs> I'm Gene Simmons. I'm like, man, that's cool. He's so tall. And so he thought it was great. And I just used to do this movie like this with my guitar over my hand. And he goes, he looks at me, he goes, punky, this, classic. You know, so, so anyway, so we, so anyway, so then we decided we go out to, um, 
So we decided to go with Jim Toby, David Joseph Management. We went out to L.A. and um, and we were sh you know shopping and deal and that sort of thing out there. And uh, and um, so Neil says, hey, I mean, not Neil, but David Joseph, our manager, says, hey, listen, uh, there's a new record company called Casablanca, Neil Bogart. I think we ought to give him a call. He's a new new company, and rather than getting on a, a, a big roster with capital and kind of get lost in the shuffle, he doesn't have that many acts right now. He has Kiss, you know, and right now, and that's his biggest thing thing right now. And Kiss hadn't really broken open wide open yet either, you know. And so, um, so so we said, yeah, you know. So he said, let me give. And so our manager said, yeah, well, the, you know, they're in town. So Neil Boger, he calls Neil Boger, and Neil Boger said, I'll tell you what, um, Kiss is playing in Anaheim, or. Or somewhere like that, in a couple of weeks. Let me put Angel on on the show with him. I'm gonna put up, and I can see what Angel looks like and how they sound. We'll do that. And he says, okay. So he says, okay. Then let me call Gene Simmons up first, and see what he says. So um. So he calls Gene up, and then he calls back about ten minutes later. He goes, I'll sign the band sight unseen because Gene Simmons says under no way will Angel ever open up for Kiss. So that you know that was pretty impressive. You know what I mean. So uh, so Neil obviously you know loved the band. He signed us to a seven seven record deal. But he also we we did all play for him in a little studio down in Burbank, and he just loved it. And so that was Casablanca from then on. You know we just you know that was it. We just you know we started recording the albums with uh, Jim Sullivan, Derek Lawrence was our first two albums. Then we had Eddie Lee, and then we had Eddie Kramer do On Earth As Is In Heaven. You know the legendary Eddie Kramer. He did that album. And then we got uh, Eddie Lee and Eddie and Lita Carlo, who did stuff with it, Jack Douglas too. In fact, he did the John Lennon album before you know, he passed away. Um, but they were great. And um, you know, and as time went on, the first albums were a certain more of a progressive kind of sound, heavier progressive. And as time went on, we started getting a little more poppier too, and heavy at the same time. We started because I think what happened was our songwriting. We were a young band. You know, when we first went out, and we got a deal pretty quickly. That our songwriting was just starting to develop too. You know what I mean? As we went along, you know, and so. Um, so then, you know, we did, we, we did, you know, the we did uh, the first Angel Angel album, then Hell of a Band, then On Earth As Is In Heaven, White Hot, and then um, Sinful, and the live album. And then we went on tour, we played with everybody you know, at the time, you know, and a lot of times we got thrown off the tour because we were, you know, blowing the headlining acts away. So they would let us play a few dates, you know, and they would try to make us, give us any room on stage and all that. But we were dressed in, we were in effect by ourselves when we came out dressed in white. And since we came out, all the kids and the girls would just rush the stage and go crazy and so we would you know we would do our thing man and just knock the dick in the dirt and so these headliners used to get pissed off so we'd play four or five shows and, and then we'd throw us off and then so we were kind of forced to head premature headline prematurely so we were really big in the midwest so we would go there and play two or three thousand seaters and sell it out and then we could do our whole illusion show where we could do everything we appeared on stage disappeared on stage we had our big hologram jewel our logo come up and talk to the audience like king kong and um so it, it was awesome, you know, so we got the headline, but then we would go back on, and get, we, we finally got on some tours with Sticks, and they were cool, Boyster Colt, Nugent, those bands, so they kept us on, you know, and it was awesome, but I remember one funny time we were playing with Aerosmith, because Lever and Krebs, I told you David Krebs was my friend, and we were playing with Aerosmith, and the first night they had like five super troopers on us, each on was a spotlight on each one of us, at one at a time, you know, and Sean said, so we just shine us, each one of us up at a time, and the next night there was four super troopers on us. The next night, three super troopers on us. The next night, two. I said, "Hey, David, why do they keep taking the spotlights away from you?" He goes, "Listen, Punky, when you're playing with a headline, you play by the headliner's rules, and they, and they feel like you're blowing them away, and they don't dig it." So that was the end of that era in the stores that they threw us off too, because we would come on and just we would kill it. We were really a live band, and we come with the tower right away, bang, and the audience would just go crazy. The girls would rush the stage and stuff, and so on. Um, so it was awesome, you know, and then mm, we just we toured and toured and toured, then we did the live album, then also Casablanca went to film, and went, I hear my train coming. <laughs> it's going around the bend. <laughs> I ain't seen the sunshine since I don't know when. <laughs> and yeah, so Casablanca got into films and TV, and so we uh, we did the movie Foxes with Jodie Foster and Sally Kellerman, Scott Bale, and um, it was a pretty cool movie, and we got to perform in the movie and, and, and play in the movie, and so that was really cool, too, so that we, now we were movie stars. <laughs> So yeah, so we went back on tour. Angel toured and toured and toured, and we had a great time. We played everywhere, all over the place, you know. And uh, fans went crazy, and we, we just had a great time. And we just, you know, it was a, it was a great experience. I mean, Angel was a, was a killer band, you know, and we were very proud of it, and everybody loved it. And so we just did our thing, man. We just ruled the world. We ruled the streets, brother. That's how that worked. <laughs>